My next exposure to aviation, I was walking through a room when I was four years old, and flying John Wayne movie Flying Leathernecks was on. And I just went, and like it rang a bell. It's like that, that thing, that's what I want to do. And as time went on, it was well either that or a Formula One race car driver, but I lacked, other than a lack of ambition, talent, and bravery, I had everything that was required for that. And I'm swallowing whole the, uh, the party line from my mom, Dr. Dennis Lawyer, Dr. Dennis Lawyer, Dr. Dennis Lawyer, until I grew up in Southern California, just after graduating high school, and I surfed, being Southern Californian. Uh, I was out waiting for the next wave just south of San Clemente, which wasn't too far from Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. And a flight of four F-4s came down low level right over the wave, where the waves were. And I, and Dr. Dennis Lawyer went right out the window. And I'm like, uh, that thing, I remember that's what I really want to do. And so the next day, I was at the University of Southern California Air Force ROTC detachment. How do I sign up? This pilot thing, that, that thing you do, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and then I ultimately got, that's how I got into uh, pilot training and, you know, the whole Air Force ROTC and pilot training. But it kind of, it started early on and I couldn't even begin to explain why it rang a bell so hard, but it sure did. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what, was there an average day, for instance? Uh, well, we probably flew between about 25 and 35 hours a month, which doesn't sound like very much, but in an airplane like the 111, the, each day you flew was really demanding. If our, you're fly, flying a four ship, and we didn't have any computers to help us at this point, you are planning a mission for four airplanes, which means you're picking a target or a specific target you're going to attack from four different directions with compressed TOTs and escape maneuvers for weapons effects. Um, you're ripping maps, putting the black lines on and the headings and the distances, and somebody's cranking the flight plan. So you, because we had inertial navs, inertial navigation systems in the airplane, but they're analog. And some I forgot to mention. The F 111E used ancient, well worn, hand tooled flying techniques because the avionics were that primitive. Wow. We had an analog INS that was just as happy to put on its tennis shoes and run away to Philadelphia as anything. It wasn't like the F-111F, which had digital and paved tack and all that stuff. It was an entirely different operation. So we're doing all this stuff by hand. Well, you, we had to show up five hours before takeoff to get all that stuff done in order to get the briefing done. And you get the flight briefing is going to take a while because it's a complicated mission to get out to the airplane and then fly a two and a half hour mission and get back and debrief it. Now you're talking a 10 hour day. One flight, 10 hour day, two and a half hour flight, 10 hours gone. And we all had our uh, separate ground duties. You know, if uh, somebody might be a scheduler or in the weapons and tactics division or uh, the uh, radar, uh, radar film division, you know, whatever, you, all, you had additional duties you had to do. And so, and we had a 12-hour day. We were not allowed. You, were, you had to get out of the squadron no later than 12 hours before your showtime on a flying day. So really, we can only fly about, mostly about three times a week. If you're an instructor pilot, uh, you'd be on, as I was, I became an instructor pilot pretty early, two-ship flight lead right at the first opportunity, four-ship flight lead at the first opportunity, and then instructor pilot. I was instructor pilot before I pinned on captain which is pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, and so the instructor pilots and four-ship flight leads, they'd be, trying to, they'd be trying to get on the schedule all the time because you just didn't have very many. And so I, there, I think there was one month where I flew 50 hours and it almost killed me. I mean, it was, it was seriously exhausting. Yeah, yeah. So really about 35, 35 hours was, what I, was I about what I sustained uh, month in, month out. And then I'm having to, in between the days I fly, uh, at one point I was the... Uh, my second tour there as assistant chief of Wing Stanaval, so I'm a standards pilot having to deal with standardization issues. Uh, I was also assistant chief of Wep Wing Weapons and Tactics, uh, which meant I had to do with all the weapon stuff we had going on, you know, any changes. To so I had real jobs that I had to do in addition to the flying job. Busy, busy. Though. Yeah, it was. So it was really it, my, my life at Upper Hayford and really throughout my time with the Air Force it was essentially 20 hours of 20 years of 12-hour days. 
<laughs> so, did you ever fly with the RAF, and how did they view the you yourself and the F-111? I did have a real fun experience flying with the RAF at Larbrook. We got, uh, they, uh, like, I think four of our airplanes, eight of us, got invited to go to Larbrook and fly jointly with the, buck, the Buccaneers that were over there at the time. And uh, one part of that I remember in particular was going to the Oak Club for the first time, and in order to be initiated, they made us all drink something really, really vile. To this day, I'm not sh quite sure how universal that initiation ritual <laughs> might have been. Perhaps it was special for us. <laughs> yeah. May have been. And we had one mission where we're the, uh, Spade Adam Range is just south of Lukers. Uh, St. Andrews Golf Course, you know St. Andrews is? Well, it's yep. kind of south and west of there, and it's kind of a big range area, and they were, they we're going to do not a red flag exactly, but there are going to be some F-15s out there defending a target area in Spade Adam, and we were operating with, there are going to be four bucks in our four 111s. Well, nobody is ever going to say that RAF guys do not have giant brass ones. Because they do. They do. There's just no getting around that. And their plan for this mission was they looked at the weather and it was going to be a clear day, dead calm. So I said, hey, we have an idea. We'll go in front and you guys hang back about three or four miles, five miles. We're going to go in front and watch what's going to happen. So what they did was they went down. They were so close to the water that they left a wake behind them. In the water. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's damn, that is damn low. Well, Mr. F-15 sees these four wakes streaking across the ocean and goes, ah, goes and starts, get airplane. And, and they dive in on what they see. It's like they see the shiny thing. Ooh, shiny thing. So they dive in on the shiny thing. Meanwhile, we're back there with our AIM-9s and going, oh, thank you very much. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> And so I just thought that was a brilliant. I, I just always remember that tactic that the R that these <laughs> Buccaneers <laughs> guy tactic, did. Yeah. So you also flew in um, a tactic, uh, tactical leadership program. Yeah, that was my first tour. Uh, they, that continued. I, th I think it probably still uh, exists now. It was, uh, TLP is called Tactical Leadership Program. At the time, it was at Javer, which is in northern Germany. And it was, they brought, I know we had German F-4s, F-104s. I think there were some Drox and some Viggins from Finland, Norway, F-5s from Norway, F-111s. So a pretty good mix of airplanes that, that we had there at Yever. And it was kind of like a, a red flag thing with more emphasis on interoperability. Mm -hmm. So how we could all work together and, and maximize our different weapon systems in concert with each other. Uh, and basically just talking to guys and getting to know guys. So, so it was, uh, we'd fly typically two missions a day. And uh, so that was really busy, uh, like two missions a day for four days a week. We didn't always have enough airplanes to do this. Uh, sometimes they broke, but that was the plan, fly two missions a day. And we'd go either up into uh, Schleswig-Holstein area, which I think is northern Germany, southern Denmark. Well, this is way back. Um, or uh, if the weather wasn't good up there, we'd go to southern Germany. F-104 is a neat-looking airplane, but God, is it slow, for instance. I mean, those guys were, you know, 420. And we're, really? yeah, I about, think about four, uh, maybe at altitude, but down on the deck. It, it, they didn't carry any gas. Maybe they could go faster, but they'd be, they'd be bingo fuel in a heartbeat. Yeah. And so it was hard to operate with them because we were going just so darn much faster than they were. And then we'd get jumped by... Uh, enemy air, red air, that would be typically the, uh, German R the German F-4s. So that was a DACT thing, and I really found the only tactic that worked, we had an F-4 get closed into, on, uh, they would close to guns. Uh, violent jinking would keep them from getting a gun tracking solution. I saw that in gun camera film, when you'd pull, mm -hmm. like you'd roll and pull, and then roll the other way and push. And so what the, the F-4 guy's thinking is you're going to be, you roll this way, you're going to turn this way, so he's going to pull some lead on you to, to shoot you. And then you're doing this to evade him, and he's thinking, oh, he's going to go the other way, and he does this and you do that. That works, but really that, 
that's never going to happen. And, you know, for an airplane operating at night, that's just not happening. It's fun, fun, uh, educational, I suppose, but not uh, operationally useful. Anyway, that was the whole point of TLP, and uh, I did a month of it. It really was useful mm -hmm. to come back from that. Uh, and as far as I know, that program's still running. Mm -hmm. I've heard lots of stories of different nations doing fast runs in the North Sea. Did you ever get the chance to do that? Oh, heck yeah. Uh, one, one of the maintenance issues they had with the 111 was that we go so fast that the paint would just get ripped off, stripped off the leading edges of the wings. And so they're and then it starts eroding aluminum, and they start having to replace the wing leading edges. And so they were always looking for coatings they could put on there to uh, prevent that. So one day they gave me an airplane. Have you ever seen that, that kind of transparent material they put over the front ends of cars to keep stones from pitting the paint? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, it was similar to that, I guess, maybe a little thicker. And they said, hey, what we want you to do so as you're coming back over the North Sea, push it up. We want to see if this stuff can take it. So sure enough, coming back from Tain Range, low level, and we were we were streaking, we were hauling, and um, came back, and it took that stuff right off. Really? <laughs> yeah, it didn't, didn't last even <laughs> one flight.